So UTIs are the most common bacterial infection we see in clinical practice with over 8 million annual physician visits. In this video, I'll be discussing the pathophysiology, risk factors, patient presentation, and the treatment approach. So let's jump right in. But before we do, please hit the like button so this video can show up for other people. Thank you. So here we have the urinary tract, and it has three main parts, the kidneys, the bladder, and the urethra. And UTIs can be divided into three as well, depending on which part of the urinary tract it affects. So if it affects the kidneys, it's pyelonephritis. For the bladder, it's cystitis. And for the urethra, it's urethritis. Since it's such a common infection, it's important to understand the risk factors. First one on the list are females. And this is because of the anatomy of the urinary tract, specifically the urethra. Now compared to males, the females have a shorter urethra to the bladder. Why is this important? Depending on how she wipes after using the bathroom, any bacteria around the anus have a shorter distance to travel to the bladder. So wiping from the back to the front can introduce bacteria into the urinary tract. Because of this, it is recommended to wipe from the front to the back instead to prevent this from happening. Next are pregnant women. And this is because of the changes in the urinary tract. The uterus sits directly on top of the bladder. Now, as the uterus grows, the increased weight can block the drainage, causing a urinary tract infection during the pregnancy. Next are patients with diabetes because of the presence of sugar in the urine. Let's just say that bacteria have a sweet tooth. Also, the older you are, the more prone you are to UTIs, your hygiene, and being sexually active. And then there are these other risk factors, and these can also increase increase your risk of developing a UTI. Now, if we familiarize ourselves with these risk factors, then when patients present with the following symptoms, we should think UTI right away. And it really depends on which part of the urinary tract the infection is. If this infection is of the lower part of the urinary tract, the patient may present with pain during urination, urgency, and blood in the urine. If it occurs in the upper part of the urinary tract, so a pyelonephritis, then the patient will present with the above symptoms for the lower urinary tract infections, plus lower back pain, which is also known as flank pain, a fever, and an elevated white blood count. Now, although UTIs are divided based on which part of the urinary tract it affects, it also has four other subcategories. So the first one is uncomplicated UTIs, and then we have complicated UTIs, which only applies to pregnant women, men, patients who developed a UTI while in the hospital, any recent urinary tract instrumentation, uncontrolled diabetes, recent antibiotic use, any urinary tract abnormalities, or being immunosuppressed. Now, after a first episode of UTI, 27% of women have a confirmed reoccurrence within the next six months, and then it's divided into two. Relapse, which is infection with the same organism within 14 days of discontinuing antibiotics for the preceding UTI. Reinfection, which is an infection with a different organism. Now, knowing all this information is important for diagnosis. And the main test we run for patients is a urinalysis, which allow us to assess all of these things, not only to determine if it's an actual UTI, but also what microorganism may be present. And I have a comprehensive video on how to interpret a urinalysis, so I will include the link right above. Also, please remember that symptoms must be present in order to make the diagnosis. After the diagnosis, it's time to treat. So for this, we will manage it based on the type of UTI it is and also which microorganism is causing it. And the type of microorganisms depend on if the UTI occurred in the community or the hospital. Of course, hospital has more resistant organisms, so we want to be even more aggressive with treatment. For the community-acquired UTIs, the most common organisms are E. coli and staph species. For the hospital acquired, the most common ones are E. coli and gram-negative bacilli, such as Pseudomonas. So now we can move on to the treatments. And of course, the medications that we use will be based on the final diagnosis, which can be asymptomatic bacteria, uncomplicated cystitis, uncomplicated pyelonephritis, or complicated UTI. 
Asymptomatic bacteriuria is the presence of bacteria in the urine of a patient that has no signs or symptoms of a UTI. We mainly screen in women who are pregnant and patients undergoing some kind of urologic procedures just because if they end up developing a serious UTI infection, it could lead to very severe complications. For pregnant women, you can screen them after their first trimester. For patients undergoing the procedure a couple days before the procedure. And for pregnant women, we treat them for four to seven days. And for patients undergoing the procedure, we treat them for one to two days. And any of these medications are options. So amoxicillin, augmentin, cefuroxine, cephalaxine, and nitrofurantoin. And these are oral medications that the patient will take at home. Next, we have patients with uncomplicated cystitis. And remember, these are patients who do not meet any of the conditions listed previously for complicated UTIs. And since it's uncomplicated, it makes sense that we could treat them in the outpatient setting. For these patients, options include Bactrim for three days, nitrofurantoin for five days, and one dose of phosphomycin. Alternatives include using fluoroquinolones or beta-lactams. Next, we have uncomplicated pyelonephritis, which is a bit more serious than the uncomplicated cystitis. So you will see that even though we are treating in the outpatient setting, we treat for longer durations, and then now we are bringing out the big guns. So this includes Bactrim for 14 days, levofloxacin for five days, or ciprofloxacin for seven days. Alternative include beta-lactams for 10 or 14 days. And lastly, in this case, you want to avoid moxifloxacin because they do not concentrate in that area. For patients with complicated UTIs, we can treat them in the outpatient setting if they are stable enough. So outpatient treatment options include Bactrim for seven to 14 days, levofloxacin for five days, ciprofloxacin for seven days, beta-lactams for seven to 14 days. For the patients with more severe disease who are admitted, options include fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides, and ceftriaxone, and we treat these patients for 14 days. So we also have to address patients who come with a recurring UTI. So this could be divided into two types. Is it a relapse where it's the same microorganism causing the infection within 14 days of discontinuing antibiotics for the preceding UTI? Or is it a reinfection with a different microorganism? For relapse, patient had another infection with the same microorganism. Hmm. So that means that the drugs we gave probably didn't work. So in this case, you want to assess for pharmacologic failure. For reinfections, we assess the number of UTIs patient has had in the past year and whether or not it's related to sexual intercourse. And from that, we may put the patient on continuous prophylactic antibiotics for about six months to one year. Before I conclude, I just wanted to discuss some of the agents we use for pregnant patients. Pyelonephritis can be very serious, so it's crucial to be familiar with some of the drugs they can receive, includes amoxicillin, ampicillin, cephalosporins, nitrofurantoin, and Bactrim. Recently, evidence has developed suggesting there is a link between the use of Bactrim and nitrofurantoin and congenital disabilities when these medications are used in the first trimester. Even though these studies have limitations, it's still currently recommended to avoid the use of these agents in the first trimester when alternatives are available. Lastly, in the late third trimester, Bactrim should be avoided due to potential of the development of canicterus in the infants following delivery. Canicterus is a type of brain damage that can result from high levels of bilirubin in a baby's blood. And that will be the end of this video. If you learned from it, please like, subscribe, comment, leave questions or feedback, and also follow me on Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.